Okay, at this time we'll have opening prayer by Pat Logwood. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning just thanking and praising you for one more day, Father God. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, for your touch of mercy and grace that allowed us to wait to the dawn of a new day, oh Father. Lord, we thank you for the protection and how you covered our household, Father God. Not just over last night, Father God, but throughout the year of 21 that allowed us to see 2022. We thank you, oh God. Lord, we just come lifting up those who have lost loved ones, who are dealing with sickness, Father God, who are dealing with all types of situations, oh God. We ask, oh God, that you would have mercy and that you would intervene. Father, you know what's best for each and every one of us. So we yes. lift anything that is on our hearts up to you, oh Father God. Yes, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to once again come together in our Bible and our Sunday school class, Father God. We thank you for each and every one of our teachers, Father God. Father God, we just thank you for the fast, the fast that we're going through that has been placed on our pastor's heart, Father God, and we know that they go together. Fasting and praying, Father God, are one, Father God. So we ask that you would give us the strength that we need, Father God, because we have a desire, Father God, but not just to know you, Father God, but to know you better, Father God. We know you, we've known you down through all of these years, Father God, but still, Father God, there are things, so many things that you want to impart within us, Father God. So with an open heart and an open mind, Father God. We surrender our bodies, Father God. We, through fasting, we surrender our thoughts through prayer, Father God, and supplication, Father God. So you may impart to uh, into us, Father God, what you would have us to know, Father God. Father God, you said to study your word, Father God, that we may rightly be able to uh, impart, Father God, the words, Father God. Lord, we, you've said in your word that if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, Father God, yes. that then shall we hear from heaven, Father God, that you would heal, give us our sin, Father God, and that you would then heal our lands, Father God. Lord, Father God, our land needs healing, Father God. There is so much going on in the world, Father God, but because we trust, know you, Father God, we're trusting you, Father God, because nothing is done without you, Father God, and we just thank you. We lift thank up our teachers to you, oh God, each and every one of them, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for how they take their times each and every week to study what they have to bring before us, Father God, and they bring it with joy and pleasure in their hearts, Father God. We thank you. We look up to us, every member of this classroom and everyone that's in a classroom today, Father God, and ask that you would touch their hearts, touch their minds, open their hearts, Father God, that we may have a listening ear, Father God, yes. and as we study, Father God, we lift up our pastors to you, Father God, ask that you would bless him and his family in a mighty way, Father God, yeah. that you would encamp your angels about them, Father God, that no weapon formed against him shall prosper, oh God, and we thank you, Father God, in advance for what we shall and learn in this class today, that we may study it, and, and impart it into our lives and in our hearts, Father God. And we thank you for the opportunity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Amen. 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 Okay. We will begin by having. Michelle Henry, read for us confirmation. Confirmation. Okay.
this uh, this session, this section that we're studying today is the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 11 through 41. And the uh, subtopic is seven men with inadequate power. Seven men with inadequate power. Okay, Michelle? Confirmation. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. Continue. Continue? Yes. To provide inter intercontrovertible evidence that the message was true, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Such miraculous confirmation was a standard feature of the apostolic preaching. In the absence of the written New Testament by which to measure someone's teachings, God uses signs and wonders to authenticate his message. 2 Corinthians 2.12, 12, Hebrews 2, 3 and 4, and Acts 2 through 22. Yeah, going forward, going forward, you can omit the scripture. Okay. Steeped in superstition and failing to understand that Paul was merely the human channel of God's power, the Ephesians did something, some amazing things. The handkerchiefs or sweatbands and aprons Paul wore during his tent making labor were even carried from his body to the sick. The idea, the idea that healing power could be magically transmitted was prevalent in the ancient world. That the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out through those means does not condemn that method as some, some would-be healers would have people believe. It must instead be viewed as nothing more than God's accommodation to the mentality of those people. And it further proved that Paul was from God and thus spoke for God. As a doctor, Luke carefully distinguishes between diseases and afflictions caused by evil spirits to make clear that not all illness stems from demonic causes. The miracles God performed through Paul were essential to convince the Ephesians that he was from God, impressed with him as the messenger of God. Their hearts were prepared to hear his message of salvation. Okay, thank you very much. Our next reader will be Robin Griffith to a do competition. Competition. But also some of the Jewish exorcists went with who went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches and seven sons of one, Sceva, a Jewish chief priest were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that home, out of that house naked and wounded. Seeing the potency of the name of Jesus, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists decided to add it to their repertoire of incantations. As John Polhill explains, ancient magicians were synchristics to add or merge other forms into one and would borrow terms from any religion that sounded sufficiently strange to be deemed effective. These Jewish exorcists of Ephesus were only plying their trade. Paul's spell in Jesus' name seemed effective for him, so they gave it a try. Like Simon Magus, the exorcist thought the power of the spirit operative in the apostles was no more than their own fakery or demonic activity and could be manipulated for their own ends. 
Accordingly, they attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. These, of course, were not Christian Jews, since they only knew Jesus as the one whom Paul preaches. Exorcist appears only here in the New Testament. It derives from a root word meaning to bind with an oath. Ancient exorcists attempted to expel demons by invoking the name of a more powerful spirit being. Exorcists were common in the ancient world, even among the Jews. Their fanciful spells and ritual formulas were very different from the absolute authority de delegated by Christ and exercised by the apostles. The name of Jesus is no longer is no magical charm to be used by whoever wants to use it as these exorcists soon learned the hard way. They address the demon with the incantation, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Unlike Paul, however, they did not know the person. They named nor have his power delegated to them. Luke asked the parenthetical note that seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priests, were doing this. Nothing further is known of Sceva, and there was never a Jewish high priest by that name. Either he was a member of one of the high priestly families, or more likely, he appropriated the title to impress his clients. That is not unlike those charitans in our own day who falsely claim to be doctors or professors. Though they may have fooled the gullible Ephesians, these would be exorcists could not fool the demon. He knew that they did not have any power over him. Speaking through the voice of his human victim, the evil spirit scornfully said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? He knew very well who Jesus was and was aware that Paul had received supernatural power over the demonic realm from him. By demanding of the exorcists, who are you? The demon challenged their authority over him. The exorcists, of course, had neither the right to use the name of Jesus nor the power to command demons. So the demon attacked them viciously. With the supernatural strength that sometimes accompanied demon possession, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all seven of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Battered, defrocked, and humiliated, they beat a hasty and ignominious, and an ignominious retreat. There, they were no doubt shocked that their attempted exorcism had so utterly failed. Presumably, Satan had allowed them in the past to appear to succeed. It can be helpful to remember that Satan's kingdom is inconsistent and random. Even his demons do not act consistently, and they form a house divided against itself, which cannot stand. Here, however, God overruled the confusion, confused efforts of these fools for his own purposes. This story vividly illustrates the danger for any who assume messianic or apostolic power over demons and Satan, and thus carelessly meddle in the supernatural realm. Satan would have wished these sons of Sceva to succeed so that the domain of darkness could compete with God as Pharaoh's magicians did with Moses. But the attempt to provide competition for the world was thwarted. In fact, it completely backfired and only brought greater conviction among the Ephesians of the power of Jesus's name and the truth of Paul's preaching. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Our next reader will be Verna and she will read Conviction. Conviction. A conviction. And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus and fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and dis disclosing their practices. 
and many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. <clears throat> the would-be exorcist fate soon became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. As a result, fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. The, the tremendous reality of the name encompassing all that is true about him of Jesus was evident to everyone. They recognized that he was no one to trifle with, but someone before whom to bow in faith. Shaken by what had happened and recognizing the futility of pagan magic, many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. Thus they displayed the turning from sin that marked genuine repentance. Praxis or practices here refers to the secret magic spells, which were generally believed to be rendered useless if they were divulged. They turned from their magic as the Thessalonians turned from their idols, not content with merely ruining their spells by, be, by revealing them. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and then began burning them in the sight of all, and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. They destroyed all their magic paraphernalia publicly in the sight of all. The staggering value of it noted as 50,000 pieces of silver which uh, was given to, uh, I'll go back, every, uh, equivalent to 50,000 days wages for an average labor, was given to indicate Ephesus widespread involvement in the magic arts. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Myrna. You're the welcome. next reader will be uh, Carolyn and she will read Domination. Can't hear you. Might be I had to unmute, I forgot. <laughs> Domination. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Luke's brief summary statement pulls the passage together and emphasizes the dominant position of the word of God achieved in Ephesus. All the satanic forces of the occult and magic arrayed against the word could not overpower it. The bold teaching of the gospel, the confirming miracles, the defeat of the exorcists, the resultant awe and respect for the name of Jesus, and the public repudiation of the magical arts demonstrated the invincible might of God's word. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, next, we'll talk about uh, part two, which is a mob of indignant citizens, a mob of indignant citizens. And Candace will start by reading the riot at Ephesus, which is verses 21 through 22. The riot at Ephesus. Now, after these things were finished, Paul proposed, Paul's purpose, Paul purpose, Paul proposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Acadia, Acadia, Acacia, yeah, yeah, Acadia. Acadia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent and have and having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus. Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. One lesson that history teaches is the paradoxical truth that the church thrives under persecution. 
effectiveness and persecution usually go hand in hand since an effective church is a bold church and a bold church is often a church made strong through suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ called his church to be the salt and light in the world. Salt stings when rubbed in wounds and light reveals the evil deeds done in darkness. Both can provoke a hostile reaction. The early church faced persecution from its inception in Jerusalem. That persecution came from organization, organized religion. In Antioch, it stemmed from prejudice and envy. In Lystia, it was the result of ignorant paganism. In Philip, in Philip, Philippi. Philippi. In Philippi, it was the reaction to a victory over the demonic realm. In, Thessalon in Thessalonica, it came from an unruly mob urged, by, urged on by jealous religious leaders. In Athens, the gospel faced the opposition of worldly philosophy. In Corinth, as in Jerusalem, it came from Judaism this time in a Rome, Roman court. Wherever the church boldly and faithfully proclaims the gospel, it faces satanic opposition. It comes as no surprise then that persecution also arose in Ephesus stemming from a pseudo, pseudo religion, materialism, Hard, hardened hearts, hypocrisy, and hatred energize the opposition to the gospel. Before describing the chaos of the riot, Luke gives a brief note on Paul's plans. As his three-year ministry in, e in Ephesus drew to a close, the apostle made plans to go to Jerusalem by way of Macedonia and Assaia. His itinerary seems puzzling since Macedonia and Assaia were in opposite directions from Jerusalem. Further, he had just ministered to those re regions before coming to Ephesus, but Paul had a definite plan in mind one that reveals his deep concern for the unity of the church. Many in the church of Jerusalem were poor and in need of sustained financial assistance. To meet that need, Paul wanted to take to Jerusalem with him a love offering from the largely Gentile churches he had founded. Before returning to Jerusalem, he revisited Macedonia and Assaia to collect that offering. By contributing to the financial needs of the Jewish believers at Jerusalem, those Gentiles would emphasize the church's unity while confirming a very practical way their love for their very pra practical way their love for their Jewish brethren describes the importance of such care. In a brother, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Jerusalem was not Paul's ultimate goal, however. After I have been there, he declared I must also see Rome. In keeping with his desire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, that I might not build upon another man's foundation. He had not yet visited the imperial capital, yet so strategic that the church there, that he could not stay away, identify indefinitely, he could not stay away indefinitely. And he explained to the members there, 
I long to see you in order that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you that you may be established. But even mighty Rome was merely a stop on the way to somewhere else for Paul. He wrote, I have often seen, I have often been hindered from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, where I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Since setting out from Antioch on his first missionary journey, Paul had been extending his ministry far, further and further west. Spain was yet westward from Rome. It was also home to some of the most influential people in the Roman Empire, such as the noted philosopher Seneca. Paul, the master strategist, was planning to reach Spain with the gospel. Paul's brief excursion, or Paul's brief expression of his desire to visit Rome marks a turning point in Acts. From this point until the end of the book, the target in the apostle's mind is Rome. He would eventually get there, although not by the means he envisioned. In the meantime, Paul sent into Macedonia two of those ministered to him, Timothy and Eratus, Erastus. Erastus to pave the way for his own return and for the collection. Timothy, Paul's friend, disciple, co-worker, and beloved spiritual son had been ministering in Corinth before joining Paul in Ephesus. At some unspecified time, Nothing further is known of Arrakis or whether he is the same individual mentioned in Romans 16.23 or 2 Timothy 4.20. Paul himself, however, stayed in Asia for a while. He delayed all his travel plans temporarily because he wrote at the, this time to the Corinthians, I am remaining in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective service has opened to me. And there are many ad, ad, adversary, adversaries. adversaries. Those adversaries soon made themselves known as a riot erupted in Ephesus over the success of Paul's ministry. Luke's account of that riot relates to its causes characteristics and calming. Okay, thank you very much, Candace. The You're next welcome. reader will be The Causes of the Riot. Uh, Betty McMary will read for us and that covers verses 23 through 27. Causes of the Riot. And about that time there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. And not only is there danger that this trade of all fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she, for, she whom all Asia and the world worship should even be dethroned from her magnificence. Luke informs us that about that time, before Paul left Ephesus, 
as he planned, there arose no small disturbance concerning the way. As noted in chapter 13 of this volume, the way was an early title for the Christian faith, probably deriving from Jesus's description of himself as the way and the truth and the light. The unseen causes of the riot was the satanic realms antagonism to the prevailing of the word, word. Demons stirred up human agents to oppose the gospel, which was spreading rapidly throughout the province of Asia. The instigator of the riot was a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith. Demetrius was a common name, and there is no reason to assume that he is the individual mentioned in John 3.12. His business was making civil shrines of the goddess Artemis, probably depicting her seated in the temple. The shrines served as household items and were presented at the temple as votive, dedicated offerings. Archaeologists have unearthed numerous terracotta shrines, but no silver ones. The latter were most likely melted down for silver content, probably even by the temple priests. Demetrius was a permanent businessman, bringing no little business to the craftsmen to whom he contracted out work. He may even have been the head of the silversmith guild. The trade they were involved in was an important and lucrative one. The worship of the goddess Artemis was widespread through the Roman Empire. These appear to have been at least 33, there appear to have been at least 33 shrines to Artemis throughout the Roman Empire, making it perhaps the most popular cult of all. Ephesus site of the impressive temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was the center of Artemis worship. Pilgrims flocked to the city, especially during the annual festival to Artemis held each spring. The trade generated by the influx of pilgrims was an essential part of the Ephesian economy. It is likely that the riot described in the passage took place during that festival. At the peak season of the sale of the paraphernalia of Artemis. Alarmed at the spread of the Christian gospel and its rejection of idol worship, Demetrius gathered together his fellow smiths, silver smiths with the workmen of similar trades. Although he would later mention more noble issues, Demetrius began his speech by bluntly stating his real concern. Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. The gospel was threatening their business and they were compelled to take action. Demetrius then reminded them of the extent of the threat posed by the Christian faith and its leading spokesman. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. The Christian preachers were denying the reality of God made with hands and they had already persuaded a considerable number of people of that truth. Like the Thessalonians, the Ephesians were turning from idols to serve the living and true God. Demetrius, a bitter opponent of the Christian faith, was forced to confess that the preaching of the gospel was successful. Significantly, he could come up with no legitimate charge of wrongdoing by the Christians. His concern was purely financial. As more people became Christians, 
the mark for the shrines would shrink. The market for the shrines would shrink. The craftsman thriving business was thus in jeopardy. What caused the success of gospel in Ephesus? First, the powerful present and diligent resentless labor of one man totally committed to Jesus Christ. Paul was an example of the influence one man can have on a city, province, state, or nation. The key to his influence was not, not a charismatic personality, a clever marketing strategy, or political influence. In his farewell speech to the elders of the Ephesus, Ephesians church, Paul reminded them, I do not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul's influence from his devotion to the Lord and to the word of truth. A second factor in the gospel success was a purged church. Records that many also of those who had believed at Ephesus kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of all and they counted up the price of them and founded it 50,000 pieces of silver. Because of the purging, the church was clean and the word of the Lord was going mighty and prevailing. A third reason for the success of the gospel was the church's use of proper spiritual means. The Ephesian believers did not lobby the city authority did not pick at the civil shops or organize demonstrations against Artemis workshop. They did not try to be popular. They preached and lived out the message and let the power of their changed lives confront and push out the old ways. Demetrius then began his speech by playing on his hearers fears of financial ruins ruining of the danger that their trade fall into dispute. How typical of a deprived mind to focus on crass materialism when eternal souls are at stake. The Lord Jesus Christ exposed the folly of that type of thinking when he asked, what does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Hell will be filled with people who, like Judas, loved money more than God. Moving up a level from personal financial considerations, Demetrius next appealed to the religious devotion. He raised the disturbing possibility that the temple of the great goddess Artemis might come to be regarded as worthless. The Christians, he warned, were challenging the majesty of Artemis. Finally, Demetrius appealed directly to the issue of income. He whom all of Asia and the world worship were to be dethroned from her magnificence. Ephesus would suffer. The temple of Artemis was famous throughout the world and it had been built with gifts from many rulers. Anything that tarnished Artemis' reputation would lower Ephesus' status, hinder civil pride, and disastrously cripple the city's economy. Loyalty to Ephesus demanded that the craftsmen oppose the new religion that threatened to undermine the city's claim to fame and source of revenue. Hey, thank you very much, Betty. You're welcome. The next reader will read for us the characteristics of the riot, covering verses 28 through 34, and that will be marked the characteristics of the riot. The mute. Yeah. 
Can I mute Mark? Can you hear me, Chesney? Yes. The characteristics of the riots. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage and began crying out saying, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. And also some of the, the Asiarchs were friends of, uh, of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing and some another for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know what cause they had come together. And some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander since the Jews had put him forward and had motion with his hand, Alexander was attending to make the defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry rose from all as they shouted for about two hours, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. The specter of the financial disaster, the challenge to their firmly held religious beliefs and the threat to their civic pride were too much for the crowd to bear. When they heard Demetrius' speech, they were filled with rage and began crying out, saying, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. Demetrius had accomplished his goal and whipped the crowd into a frenzy. Inflamed by his incendiary speech, the people surged into the streets, invoking the name of their goddess. Like the Chaldeans of Jeremiah's day, they were mad over fearsome idols. The infuriated crowd manifested the first characteristic of the riot, anger. Such mindless fury typifies riots, which anger runs rampant and violence is indiscriminate. It is also typical of the way the world reacts to Christianity. When the Jewish leaders heard Stephen's masterful speech in defense of Christianity, they were cut to quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Similarly, the enraged mob at Philippi rose up together against, uh, rose up against Paul and Silas and the chief magistrates tore their robes off and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into a prison in Jerusalem. And the Jews from Asia upon seeing Paul in the temple began to stir up all the multitudes and laid hands on him crying out, men of Israel come to our aid. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and the law and this place. And besides he had been brought Greeks into the temple and had defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesians of the city with him. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple and all the city was aroused and the people rushed together and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple and immediately the doors were shut and they were seeking to kill him. A report came up to the commander of the Roman cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. The gospel makes people angry because it confronts them with all their false religions and their sins and forcing them to recognize the inadequacies of the worldview, exposing the emptiness of their lifestyle. A second characteristic of the rise was confusion. As the frenzy riders swarmed toward Ephesus, the city was filled with the confusion, chaos, and disorder they caused. Surging through the main streets, they came down the hill where they rushed with one accord in the theater and seized Gaius and Aristocritus and Paul traveling companions with Macedonia. According to Acts 24, Aristostarchus was from Thessalonica, a city in Macedonia. The verse, however, lists Gaius hometown as Derby, a city of Galatia. It may be as some commentators argued that the plural genitive Macedonus from Macedonians were originally singular. In that case, it would be described from Aristarchus. However, Gaius was a common name, and the one mentioned in 24 may be different 
may be a different individual. Aristarchus was a beloved companion of Paul, whom accompanied him on his ill-fated voyage to Rome. Acts 27, 2, and shared his imprisonment in, the, in that city. He was a Jewish believer, since Paul described him along with Barnabas' cousin Mark and Jesus, who also who is called Justice, as a fellow worker for the kingdom of God who are from the, from the circumcision. The theater, ruins of which are remarkably preserved today, was a normal place for town meetings to be held. As the largest public building in the city, holding approximately 25,000 people, it was the only place such a large crowd could gather. When he heard what was happening, Paul wanted to go into the assembly. The courageous apostle went to charge into the theater to rescue his friend and defend the cause of Christ against Demetrius' charges, realizing for Paul to appear before the unruly mob would only endanger his life. The disciples would not let him, although the apostles did not consider his life of, of any account as dear to himself. Acts 20, 24, the other believers would not allow him to risk his life needlessly. Not only did Paul's fellow Christians restrain him, but also some of the RCRs were friends of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. The RCRs were members of the noblest and wealthiest families of the province of Asia and were bound together in a league for promoting the cult of the emperor and Rome. Every year, as an Asiarch was elected from the entire province, and an additional Asiarch were elected for each city that had a temple honoring the emperor. The title was probably born for life by the officers in the league, so in Paul's day, there could have been a number of Asiarchs at Ephesus. Richard N. Lonecker, Acts of All, Apostle, and Frank Gablin, the Appository Bible Commentary. Fearing for Paul's safety, the RCR repeated him not to venture into the theater, for such prominent individuals were friendly to Paul is insignificant. Everett F. Harrison writes, the very fact that such men of prominence and wealth were Paul's friend reveals the utmost clearness that they did not regard him as dangerous or as carrying on an unlawful activity. He is positive proof that the emperor called the worship of the uh, Roman emperor had not yet come to the point of opposing the Christian cause. The act of Galileo may have been influential in making the officials of the province favor to Paul. Meanwhile, the situation in the theater was one of the most complete chaos. Some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. The Luke's ads which touch then Luke add, which with a touch of satire, the majority did not know for what cause they had come together. Swept up in mob hysteria, most people in the crowd didn't even understand the issue. A final characteristic of the riot was close-minded it produced. According to NAC, NASAB translation, some of the crowd concluded the causes of the commotion was Alexander, since the Jews had put forward Son Basil concluded can as, as the ASB marginal note indicates be translated instructed in that that case the text would be saying that some in the crowd, the Jews instructed Alexander to speak for them. Climbing onto the stage and having motion with his hand, Alexander was intended to make a defense to the assembly. He may have seen a Christian Jew or more likely a spokesman for the unbelieving Jews. Any identification of him with Alexander's of the pastoral epistles is doubtful due to the commonness of his name. In either case, the Jews' pur purpose for putting him forward was the same. Fearing that the riot might turn into a program riot, they wanted to disassociate themselves from the Christian. Their attempt, however, backfired when the mob recognized that Alexander was a Jew. A single outcry arose from all as they shouted for about two hours, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. To the pagan crowd, there would have been little difference between Christians and Jews. 
Both worship an invisible God and both rejected idolatry. The minds of the pagans were close to that, close to what Alexander might have to have, might have to say. Instead, they drowned him out with their shouts of great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Completely out of control, they kept up there screaming for about two hours. Thank you very much, Mark. You're welcome. Our last reader will be Lillian Jones, and she will read The Calming of the Riot, verses 35 through the end, verse 41. Lillian. The Calming of the Riot. <clears throat> and after quieting the multitude, the town clerk said, men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven. Even then, these are undeniable facts. You ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash, for you have bought these men here who are neither robbers of temple nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have, uh, have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and the court of any, I'm sorry, of any man, the courts are in session and pro-counsel pro are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in a lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's affair. Since there is no real cause for it, and in, the connection, and in this connection, we shall be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. And after saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Finally, after two hours of riotous confusion, order was restored by the town clerk. As the city, as the city's chief administrative office, officer, the equivalent of a mayor or a modern of a modern day city, and liaisons between and liaisons between the city council and the Roman authorities, he was Ephesus' leading citizen. As such, he knew the Roman the Romans would hold him responsible for what happened. After quieting the multitude, he began to address its members. Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and the image which fell down from heaven? He reminded them that it was common knowledge throughout the Roman world that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis the image which fell down from heaven, probably refers to the meteorite, uh, John Profil notes. Meteorites were often associated with the worship of the mother goddess, Artemis. The most famous of these was a sacred stone taken from Pessinus to Rome in 204 BC. A meteorite also seems to have been associated with the cult of the Tarian of the Tarian Artemis. Although there is no evidence beyond this text for such a sacred stone being connected with the uh, Ephesians cult, the Ephesians cult, it is altogether likely that one existed given this common association of the mother goddess with a stone from heaven, Acts 4.13. Uh, the town clerk went on to point out that, the, that since then these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and to do nothing rash. Nothing the Christian preachers could do, he insisted, could possibly affect their great, their great goddess, Artemis, power uh, uh, it could possibly affect their great goddess Artemis's power, which undeniable, undeniable and her reputation secure. Although the men were 
was sincere. He was, although the man was sincere, he was tragically mistaken. Today, no weapons, no worship, no one worships Artemis, yet millions worship the Lord Jesus Christ. The town clerk then turned to more serious issues and rebuked them. You have bought these men here who are neither robbers or temple or of the temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. Even this pagan official testified to the Christians' character. They were not thieves, nor did they use insulting languages, despite Demetrius's claim. <coughs> the Christians had not acted improperly. Having reassured the crowd, he next, he next criticized Demetrius and the craftsmen for speaking, for sparking the riot. Rather than restoring to mob action, they should have followed the due process of the law. After all, he reminded them, the courts are, ses are in session and pro-councils are available. Let them bring charges against one another. Anything that could not be settled in the courts should be settled in a lawful assembly. The town clerk then concluded his speech with a sobering warning, for indeed we are in danger of being accursed, accused of a riot in connection with today's affairs, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we shall be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. Again, he exonerated the Christians, admitting that there is no real cause for the riot. Consequently, they were in danger of being accused of a riot by the Roman government, and they would be unable to account for their this disorderly gathering. If the Romans investigated the disturbance, the Ephesians would be unable to defend their actions. That could result that could result in loss of privilege, of the privileges the Romans had got, had granted them. His arguments were persuasive, and when he dismissed the assembly, he went quietly. As far as not as far as is known, Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen did not pursue the matter any further. The Ephesians believers weathered the storm of the persecution unleashed by Demetrius's speech and the resulting, and the resulting riot. Indeed, the church at Ephesus would play a prominent role in the church's history for several centuries. So again, in Acts, God caused the wrath of man, men to praise him in Psalm 76, 10. Okay, thank you very much to all of you readers who helped us today. So at this time, we can unmute. Get ready for closing. Yeah, ready, D. Can we all hear what's going on for the prayer? Yes, we can. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come to your throne of grace firsthand. Thank you for allowing us to see another new year. So many of us have friends and family that, that didn't see this new year. We ask you, Father, for anyone who is grieving the loss of someone they know or have a friend or whomever that they are missing. Give them comfort that only you can give, Father. Give us peace that surpasses all understanding, Father. We come to you asking you to go before us today in whatever capacity we need it. Because you already know what we have need of, Father. So we put it all in your hands. We go to the cross and we put it at the feet of our Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, you've heard the prayers that were mentioned today, family who have lost loved ones, people who are struggling with accidents. It's just so much going on, Father. I can't remember all of the requests, but you already knew what they were before we even had them. We have requests that haven't even been uttered, Father. And we just ask you in the name of 
Jesus, to give us peace in all this going on around us, all the chaos, Father, all the pain, all that we just don't understand. But this is nothing new to you, Father. It may be new to us, but we ask you, Father, to calm our spirits. Father, give us wisdom. You said if we ask for wisdom, you would give it to us regularly. So give us wisdom in all decisions that we have to make. Give us wisdom in people that we talk to, Father. Give us the words that edify and lift up people, Father. Give us words that give comfort to those who are going through, even if we don't know what they're going through, Father. Let us be the good person in somebody's life, Father, because you are always good to us. Let us show us, let us show those who we are around us your mercy, your grace that you give us every morning, Father. I thank you, Father, for loving us because of and in spite of, Father. I ask you to bless every home that is represented here, Father. I ask you to give them peace. I ask you to give them wisdom. I ask you, Father, to give them discernment for people that are coming to their life, whether they be friend or family, Father. I ask you, Father, to bless every teacher that works so diligently to bring your word to us that we can understand it better than we've ever done before, Father. I thank you for this house of whole Father, our church. I ask you to bless the shepherd of this house, Father, that continuously to their praise over us and diligent works over us, Father. I thank you so much, Father, for leading us and guiding us to a place that not only preaches your word, but teaches you your word, Father, so that we can understand it and give it to other people who do not know you and maybe heard of you, but don't understand you, Father. Let us be the preacher in someone's life. Let us be the teacher in someone's life. You to give us wisdom of how to spread your word to each and everybody. Father, I ask you to send between the Chicago public school system and the teachers in the father, let there be a mediation so that our children can go back not to only just our students and our children, father, but our teachers who want to teach our children, father. I ask you to bring a spirit of peace and unity so that we can all get back to some sense of normalcy, Father. Our children need to learn, Father. Our, te te our children need to learn, and our teachers want to teach them. We all be safe. We all want to be, we want to be well, Father. I ask these things, there's so many things that are on the hearts and minds of all my classmates, Father. And I ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Amen. 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 Amen.